Hello, everyone. Welcome so to this wonderful webinar that we're having through HB Studio. My name is Lauren. I'm the production manager at HB, and I'm honored to introduce the internationally renowned composer, performer, sound artist, and actor Joan LaBarbera. Uh, she will be sharing a taste of her vocal technique and style today, which explores the human voice as a multifaceted instrument. And following this talk and mini performance concert from her, we will have a short Q&A that will be moderated. Um, so feel free to send along your questions in the Q&A section during that time. Um, and thank you again for joining us and please enjoy. Welcome Joan, come on in. There we go. Hi, Lauren. Hi there. And welcome, everyone. Um, I think I'll start by telling you a little bit about um, the music that you heard during the, um, the pre-show, for those of you who were on early. Um, that's a work of mine called Aaron. Um, it was uh, inspired by a photograph that I saw in um, the Herald Tribune, the International Herald Tribune, a number of years ago, of um, a father carrying the coffin of his son, who was an Irish Republican army, uh, in the Irish Republican army, and had been imprisoned, and had died of a hunger strike. I was very moved by the photograph, and um, I decided to write a work that um, was inspired by, by Ireland and all the things I think about Ireland. And when I think about Ireland, I, I think a lot about um, languages, of course, um, different sounds, um, the wonderful writers that came from Ireland. And so um, I was thinking, for instance, of, of James Joyce, of Samuel Beckett, um, and then creating a number of characters in my mind. Um, all the sounds on that recording were made from my voice. Um, there was no electronic manipulation, a little bit of equalization, a little bit of reverb, but all basically the sounds that I make with my natural voice. And um, so one of the reasons that I'm doing this mini concert this evening and talking to all of you is that I will be doing a workshop for HB Studios. We have not yet uh, set the dates. Um, but we will, uh, we're talking about it, and um, so what I wanted to do was to introduce you to some of the sounds that I make. And the idea is that the voice is a really incredible instrument and has so many more possibilities than simply speaking or singing melodies. There are lots and lots of sounds that can be made with the natural human voice. Um, now I'm going to be doing another work. This one is just for solo voice. It's called Solitary Journeys of the Mind. It's what I call a real-time composition, which means that essentially I'm improvising, but I'm improvising on a set of um, patterns or motives, uh, a set of, of sounds that are the kind of ingredients that I use for this piece. Um, it has varying lengths, depending on um, how my voice is feeling. And um, uh, let's see, I'm looking at the chat right now. No echo on my device. <laughs> okay, you guys work that out. <laughs> I'm not going to deal with that. Um, okay, so this is Solitary Journeys of the Mind. Oh my Oh my Oh, 
Short little piece. Um, let's see. I'm getting a message from Lauren. And there. Am I doing it now? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so the next work um, that I'm going to perform for you tonight is part of an opera that I've been working on uh, for quite a number of years. Um, it started out inspired by the life and work of Virginia Woolf. Um, and um, 
I was working with an ensemble at that time uh, called Next Works. Um, and we did a performance at a space in Chelsea called the Chelsea Art Museum, which um, is no longer an art museum. It's now, I think, Hewlett Packard or something <laughs> like that. Anyway, um, the first performance that I did of this work, I took little fragments from Virginia Woolf's work and gave uh, these text fragments to my musicians. And I distributed them around the room. It was a very, very large art, art gallery. Um, and I had said in advance to the cellist, um, can you play lying on your back? And he said, sure, I do that all the time. Um, and so I, I distributed them around, had given them these fragments that they were going to improvise with. And I basically said to them, um, you are all Virginia Woolf, and gender is not an issue. Now, at the time, all the members of that ensemble were male. So that was something they had to get used to. Um, anyway, as, as I worked on the piece um, over the years, I began to um, incorporate some ideas from the work of the American sculptor, filmmaker, visual artist, um, assemblagist, Joseph Cornell, um, and began to, um, to combine some of the idiosyncrasies of their personalities. They were verse, both very, very singular um, individuals, um, pretty troubled. Um, but um, I, I decided to, to use ideas from their works, um, as I said, some fragments from Joseph Cornell's dreams. And um, I came up with this soundscape that I'm going to now be playing and singing over um, called Windows. Um, Cornell uh, was born and raised in Nyack. Um, and um, after his father died, uh, his mother and the family moved to Queens to Utopia Parkway. Um, and um, he, would, he would travel on the subway into Manhattan every day. And uh, he had to work in the textile industry. Um, and uh, he loved looking in at windows. And so when the subway would, would go across the water, um, it was actually above ground. And I imagined him looking, peering into the windows of, of the, the apartments as the train would pass by and some of the things that he would think about. He created these very, very beautiful boxes, um, very small boxes. Um, if you remember back in elementary school, you probably made shadow boxes. And um, he, he never painted or, or drew, but he cut out these uh, various things from magazines and, and different places and created these beautiful collages. So, enough talk. I will um, make sure that I'm sharing my sound. Yes, I am. Okay. And go over here. And this is a work called Windows.
So that was Windows. Um, I see in the chat that someone wanted to know uh, the dates of some of these pieces. 
So um, Windows, the recordings, were, were begun in 2013, and I've added to them over the years. Um, and then when I add a live voice part on, um, I'm doing that obviously in real time. And I'm working with the materials that I know are on the recording. Um, Aaron, which is the work that was playing in the sort of pre-show and into the opening, um, is a work that was recorded initially in 1980 um, in um, the recording studios at um, Eindhoven in Holland, the VPRO studios. Um, and in 2016, I was approached um, by Johan Johansson, uh, a composer, a uh, film composer predominantly. Um, he was working on the film Arrival. And uh, he wanted very much to use a section from Aaron. Those of you who've seen the film Arrival, uh, you probably know uh, what section I'm talking about. But it's, it's the one that's a sort of imaginary language and it develops one syllable at a time and is a kind of circular form. And he felt that that would be perfect for um, the language of the heptapods. These are the, the aliens um, in that film. Um, and, uh, but he wanted me to re-record it. And I was working on um, a, a commission right at that point in time for the Young People's Chorus of New York City, a work called A Murmuration for Chibuk. And I said, Johan, I don't have time to re-record it. Just take the fragment that you want and pitch shift it. Um, so what he did actually was to do both that and also re-record sections of it. So um, when you see the film Arrival and you see, I believe the first time um, the, the fragments from Aaron show up in, um, in it, uh, are it's, it's something he now calls Heptapod B. Um, but also um, the teaching montage where the, the scientist and the, the, uh, the linguist were trying to learn the language of the heptapods. So um, my work is incorporated into a lot of that film. Um, and you can actually, you can find it online, um, uh, both Heptapod B and... Uh, uh, let's see, the end credits and a number of other selections from, from that. Um, and Solitary Journeys of the Mind, um, I've been working on for a number of years. Because it's a real-time composition, uh, it's, it's different every time. Um, I would say the first time that I performed it live was probably around 2007. So um, I hope that... Uh, that answers those questions. I, I also wanted to talk a little bit about what I'll be doing in the workshop. Um, what I'll do is um, basically start with my warm up, my vocal warm up, which is silent, of course. <laughs> it's, it's all about relaxation for the shoulders and the neck. Um, and it involves getting the whole body prepared to make sound, to make music. I then go through um, a number of exercises, tongue exercises, for example, because the back of the tongue is connected to the vocal folds with cartilage so that when you uh, gently stretch the tongue, you are automatically bringing blood up to um, the whole area where the voice, uh, the vocal sound is made. Um, I then go through um, um, resonance placement. So um, uh, dealing with you know, what we refer to as the mask, basically the skull and the bones uh, of the skull, and learning to place the sound in different areas within the head, the neck, the face, behind the cheekbones, uh, center of the forehead, these wonderful little uh, compartments in the nose that I use uh, to do the harmonic focusing. <coughs> So dealing with those sounds, um, ululation, which is that sort of fluttery sound that I make, um, inhaled glottal clicks, <coughs> that kind of thing, um, and uh, a number of other of other sounds. Um, uh, the multiphonic, which is basically double stops for the voice. <coughs> So 
sometimes easy to get, sometimes not so easy to get. Um, but uh, I, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, the kind of work that I've done in film, in, in voiceovers. Um, the, the first one I was invited to do was a film called Date with an Angel, uh, in which Emmanuel Bayard uh, played an angel who had fallen to earth. And um, the filmmakers wanted her to make otherworldly sounds. Uh, and evidently all she could think of to do was squeak. And so when they test marketed the film, uh, and this beautiful woman opens her mouth, uh, a squeak comes out, and the audience fell on the floor laughing. Well, that wasn't necessarily what they wanted. Um, and so the sound designer uh, contacted me and said, you know, can you help us? So I, they flew me out to Los Angeles, and uh, we worked on a sound stage. And I basically replaced her voice for about 90% of the film. Uh, we did three uh, complete separate tracks. One was a more musical track. One was um, mm, sort of strange sounds, otherworldly sounds. And one was speech-like, but not too speech-like. Um, and then, uh, so they used that. The, the, the sound designer uh, mixed my sounds with um, other sounds that, that he had and came up with this composite voice uh, for her. Um, the next one that I was invited to do was uh, for the movie Alien Resurrection. Um, and um, it was this, the voice, voicing the sound of the alien newborn, which was a clone of a clone of Ripley, Ripley being the main character, the, the um, captain of the ship, portrayed by Sigourney Weaver, and the alien queen. Uh, and, you know, it's science fiction. Anything goes. So um, this, there was this monster, uh, ab about, I think, about 17 feet tall. Um, and they did have someone who had created some sounds for it, but uh, the director felt that it, it made the, uh, the monster sound more like Godzilla. Uh, and so they brought me out, and uh, so I worked a lot with uh, Jean-Pierre Jeannet, which is who was the director of the film. And he said, the problem is that because it's a clone of Ripley, it's part human and part alien. Um, so he said, we want some human quality to the sound, but not too human, because in the death scene, what happens, and it's, a, it's an incredible scene, you can, you can actually find it on YouTube. There, there's a beautiful, uh, loving scene between the monster um, and its mother, Sigourney Weaver, Ripley, uh, but because she's the captain of the ship and this monster is going to wreak havoc on the ship, she has to actually commit infanticide. So she takes uh, saliva from the monster's tongue and throws it against uh, the window of the spaceship, and it's some sort of acid, you know. If you want to ask questions, you can say, well, how could she take the saliva in her hand and not burn up her hand? Well, it's because she and the monster share a lot of DNA. Anyway, uh, it's, it's an extraordinary scene because you actually see um, the sorrow, the, the, the horror, uh, the betrayal on, on the face of, of the monster, and the look on Ripley's face of, of apology, and it, it's, it's a beautiful scene. Anyway, um, they had broken it up, this, the death scene, into about 10 or 11 very short segments. Uh, and they played me the whole visual. And I said, well, I don't want to do it broken up. I want to do it as one long take. Um, uh, because I, I decided that to break it up would, would, would spoil the flow. I had already um, analyzed what the creature, what kinds of sounds the creature could make. Um, very, very bony skull. And this, you know, as all the aliens, this, this huge uh, protuberance in the back, which could be a great echoing uh, uh, place to have sound. It didn't have lips, had teeth, but no lips, uh, really terrible teeth, um, and a huge tongue, long tongue. So I had decided that I was going to make most of the sounds 
inhaled so that I wouldn't be tempted uh, to, to use my lips. And so I got them to uh, knit back together the whole scene. And uh, I did that scene in one long take, inhaled and exhaled, and just constantly uh, working with the movement of, of the monster and, and the sounds, sort of pulling those sounds into me and, uh, and just doing it. When I got done with it, they said, that's it. We love it. Um, so, angels and monsters. Uh, anyway, the reason I talk about all these things, the reason that I did this little mini concert for you, is because um, one of the problems that Emmanuel Bayard had was that she didn't have the tools to think about an otherworldly sound. And so one of the things that actors uh, can do is to actually explore this vocal instrument um, and just you know find out the wonderful possibilities that it's capable of and if you think of music from other other cultures um, there's a wealth of, of material um, that uh, that comes from the vocal music of various cultures I've learned a lot just listening and imitating sounds um, I imitate a lot of sounds uh, I imitate birds I imitate monkeys I imitate chimpanzees, I imitate a uh, Sumatran ape. There was a, a work that I did called Urban Tropics that I did some imitating of, of a Sumatran ape. Um, but also I, I, I imitate a lot of music of other cultures just to find out what it feels like. Um, and so this is the kind of exploration that I will be doing in, in, um, in the workshop. So Lauren, uh, why don't you come back on and um, see if there are some, some questions other than the one about the dates <laughs> that I already de dealt with. But Of course, yeah. I think we have one question already in the Q&A section from John Vandever. And for anyone who does have a question uh, moving forward beyond John's question that I have here, if you want to raise your hand, it will pop up um, for, my, for me and I can uh, allow you to even ask your own question. I don't need to read it for you. So just uh, raise your hand in that uh, area on your screen and I can let you talk, but if not, you can send it through the Q&A. So the one that we have from John is, the overtones are glorious to experience. Uh, I had a question about form. Do you consciously think of form or a sense of time space form? From a perspective of the audience, one could deduce some sort of built-in structure due to uh, leitmotifs of some sort. Uh, yes, I do think about form. Um, for the works that, that are real time, composition. As I said, I have certain certain elements, certain motivic gestures that I use. Um, I repeat them, but I try to alter them. And then when they're no longer interesting to me, I move on to another sound. Um, so the, the structure of, for instance, Solitary Journeys of the Mind starts and ends with, with similar gestures, um, but has a lot of material uh, in the midst of it. Um, with a work like Aaron, it was much more sort of episodic, um, dealing with, um, it starts out with my image of um, little old ladies talking, uh, chattering, so it's a lot of chattery sounds. It then moves into um, sounds that are more like the fishermen down by the seacoast, hauling in their nets and growling and talking to each other. So going from female characters to male characters, um, then that sort of very, very chattery uh, ululation thing, and then getting into that language, which is the centerpiece. Uh, and then there is what I refer to as a, um, a multiphonic choir uh, that is the the long ending of that piece. Um, it's just layers and layers. I think it was about 16 layers of my voice doing multiphonics and overtone focusing. Uh, and then comes back and finishes that little uh, word fragment at the very end. So yeah, I, I do think about, about form and about um, the audience's journey through the work. So sometimes, um, like with windows, I will introduce a sound that's going to come later on. I'll introduce it with my voice. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll try to work 
inside the sound and and just blend and and meld my voice into the texture that I've already created. Um, but of course, I know what's coming, so I I can introduce different aspects of the sound and just uh, determine how long I want to spend in any one particular section of the work. Well, thank you so much for uh, your question, John, and for your answer, uh, Joan. So Mary also has a question, Mary Golden. Have you been influenced by Native American chants? Um, I, I spent about 18 years living in the Southwest, um, in Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico. And I went to a number of um, ceremonies, dances, uh, corn dances, for example. Uh, so I did hear a lot of uh, Native American singing and drumming. Um, sure, I think I'm influenced by everything. Um, everything I've ever heard is sort of stored in my my memory banks, and uh, I don't I don't try in my compositions to imitate the music of other cultures. What I do is I, I allow the influences to to come forward. Um, I listen to um, the Inuit Eskimo throat singers also, and there's a work of mine called Berliner Träume. Uh, where I, I do this kind of inhaled, exhaled, <laughs> forming a, a kind of a rhythmic pattern. Um, the, the Inuit, it's, it's music that's done by women, and they, are, they sing facing each other, and their mouths are very close so that the, the sounds of each other are resonating in the other person's mouth. Uh, and it's a kind of game that they play, and the person who laughs first loses. <laughs> but um, I hope that answers your question. I, I influence, yes. Imitation, not really. So. All right. Well, thank you, Mary, for that question. Um, and this is from Lewis. Um, uh, from him, he says, for Joan, long time no here. Um, his question is, I always felt since the mid-60s, in fact, that the multiphonic work I heard from you decades later had much to do with that of the Tibetan monks, which influenced Stockhausen. Are techniques, uh, in fact, are these techniques, in fact, related, especially in the act of singing fundamental pitch plus overtones? Okay, so um, I, when I started improvising, I just started to try to find out what the voice could do. Um, and I had uh, an ensemble that I worked with called the New Wilderness Preservation Band. Uh, and we worked a lot with poets and writers. And in one of our sessions, um, Jerome Rothenberg was reading from Milarepa, a Tibetan uh, mystic scholar. Uh, it was the I think it was the Tibetan Book of the Dead, but the sound that came out of me was this multiphonic sound. Now, I didn't know what I was doing. It was just a sound that came out. Luckily, we were recording, and I could go back and listen um, and try to figure out how to recreate that sound using a good technique. And that's, that's the other thing is um, I, I'm a trained classical singer, uh, I worked with a number of different teachers over the years, and, and the technique that I use, I feel, is, is very healthy. I don't do things that um, are going to damage the instrument. And so the interesting thing about what you say sounds like the Tibetan monks, what the Tibetan monks are doing is really singing those low tones. They're chanting. They're praying. Um, and so they're singing these very, very deep tones. And because of the words that they're saying, they're, they're, um, they're actually also getting these overtones that are sort of circling up above. What I do, what I, what I learned I am doing, is I've, I've actually trained the false vocal folds to sympathetically vibrate with the true vocal folds. So it's a lot to do with the mind. It's a lot to do with relaxing um, the instrument. Um, there are two ways of getting there. One is to start with what's referred to as a vocal fry, and then which is a subtone. It's a noise sound. And to sort of 
lift, as it were, lift that sound up until it's in pitch territory. The other one, which I found easier to do, is to take a, a kind of a comfortable mid-range sound and then let it drop down and engage the false vocal folds. Let me try. <laughs> it's it's um it's very elusive. It's it's uh, it's hard to get a handle on it, and and when I'm teaching it, um, I I tell people not to get frustrated and not to force it because if you try to push it, it goes away. Um, so, it's definitely not what the Tibetan monks are doing, um, but it it has a similarity to that sound. I hope that helps. <laughs> All right. And we have another question, or a, a new question from Drew Bowles. Do you have any recommendations for helping keep the throat loose and free of tension from ex uh, when exploring extended vocal techniques? Well, first of all, as I said, I, I do these exercises um, for, for the neck, the shoulders, um, tongue exercises, uh, also, you know, turning your head from side to side slowly, very slowly, and, and feeling where, where you find the tension and trying to breathe into that. Um, there's actually um, a mini masterclass that I recorded for New Music Box uh, that you can find online if you want to take a look at that. I recorded it uh, several years ago with a singer who had never done extended techniques and I went through all of the exercises with her. But um, I, I don't start singing until I've done these relaxation um, exercises. Um, if you're exploring on your own and you you find a sound and it makes you cough, that's an indication that's a problem. So you have to think about what you're doing. Always use your brain. Record if possible so that if you find a sound that you like, go back and listen to it and imagine that sound coming out of you and then um, try to make adjustments, keeping your, your throat feeling very relaxed. So you're never pushing, you're never putting pressure. Um, one of the things that I noticed, I, I took a lesson one time with a Tuvan throat singer, uh, Sainkon Nam Chailuk, and I, because uh, I was fascinated by, by those sounds, which also have some similarities to some of the things I do. I was sort of horrified with her technique, which puts a lot of pressure <laughs> it's a very b extreme pressure uh, on the, the neck. And so I decided one lesson was enough. <laughs> I wasn't going to do that anymore. But um, if you find sounds that you like, experiment with them. See how they make you feel. See if you can um, analyze where the sound is being placed and, and find a place uh, to put that sound and work with it. But again, if, if something makes you cough, stop. If them, something um, makes you feel fatigued, that's another clue. Um, I would never spend more than, let's say, five to seven minutes exploring any one technique when you're beginning because you've got a lot to learn um, there, there are, and you don't wanna, you don't wanna do any damage. You can't do any damage in five, five or seven minutes, I hope. <laughs> Well, thank you, Drew, for that question. Um, we have a question from Jenna, which is, uh, she says, beautiful work. Are you familiar with Dave Mallory's song cycle ghost quartet? Yes. Gelsey, uh, she says, Gelsey Bell uses some extended vocal technique in it, and she's wondering if you know how uh, Bell produces the type of scream slash singing that she does in that song photograph. and. In addition, she would love to know um, if you could speak a bit about your experience with practice regimen and the practice techniques you have in the beginning of this sort of uh, extended vocal technique journey. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just talking about Gelsey. Um, Gelsey and I have worked together uh, on a number of occasions. Um, that scream sound? No. I don't know how she does it. 
Uh, you'd have to ask her. Uh, but um, there, Gelsey did her her PhD thesis on um, performance practices and a lot of uh, extended techniques uh, that are from a number of different cultures, including uh, popular culture, you know, screaming, um, various kinds of sounds that, that rock singers, we'll just generically say rock singers make. Um, but um, what was the second part of the question? The second part is um, your your experience with practice regimen and the beginning stages of uh, a journey like this with, with this technique. Yeah. Um, a lot of listening. Um, a lot of, of uh, sound making and exploring. Um, as I said, you know, thinking about the different resonance areas in, in your, your face, uh, the center of the mouth, uh, and then you know, the, the cheeks, the behind the cheekbones, uh, all these wonderful nasal bones here, and just try moving sound around uh, inside your head. Taking a single pitch and trying, you know, to place it one place and then move it into another place, see if you can really identify uh, the different sound that, that you get, whether the sound is like right here, um, uh, in front of the, the upper teeth or whether it's, you know, down in the nose here. You know, when I, when I uh, teach the, um, the uh, overtone singing, I start with an E sound, which is sort of way, way up here. And it's, it's kind of brittle sound. But then gradually I move it down into these little compartments that you find. Uh, inside the nasal passages. And basically I'm going from an E, E, U. So I'll just give you a quick demo. E, so the wonderful um, muscles uh, at the sides of the mouth when you get down into the er sounds, and, you know, uh, it's the sound of a bandpass filter. So you, you, can, you can listen to people doing um, overtones, or you can uh, uh, listen to a bandpass filter <laughs> and try to imitate that. Um, but it's, it's a lot of experimenting, uh, trying things out and just seeing uh, what works for you. And I know that, that people do, who do overtone focusing do them in many different ways. Um, uh, some of them really deal with, with the, the cheeks. What you're essentially doing as, as you're you know, moving the sound around is you're actually changing the shape of the vocal tract. So by, by focusing the sound in, in these different areas, what's happening as a result, your tongue is moving, and, but you're, you're changing the shape of what's going on inside and, and resonating the, the sound inside your head. All right, so we have three more questions and I think okay. that'll wrap us up. So the next one is from John Montague. Can you discuss the relationship between the physical execution of the sound and the way that you access those sounds via images, feelings, and emotions? Hmm. Complicated question. Um, so I've been at this a long time. Uh, will 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 grant me that uh, about fifty years of of experimenting with the voice, um, but when I create pieces, um, uh, oftentimes I'll use uh, either visual imagery or um, or text. Uh, as I said, you know, working with Joseph Cornell's dreams, there's a lot of really rich, beautiful imagery, and I also do a lot of recording. So when I'm building my pieces. I may be um, making a kind of visual collage of, of the images that I have in my mind, and then I'm trying to reflect those images uh, with the sounds that I'm building, whether it's just voice or whether it's um, instruments or whether it's electronics that I'm adding on. So it's not that I'm necessarily like recreating a painting, like this painting back here, I would, that would take me a long time to recreate. Uh, but I, I do have a lot of influence um, from, from visual art, uh, from poetry, and, and um, 
various things like that. All right. And the next question is from John Vandiver. Um, how have you seen this exploration of bodily voice develop in the modern composition of culture? Your work seems unique and the, ex uh, the exploration of the human voice, um, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but he's saying as opposed to an atypical compositional pattern. Hmm. I'm not sure. Um, you know, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I mean, the voice is my main instrument. I do uh, compose for other instruments. Um, there, when I started my exploration, there were not uh, very many other people who were doing this kind of thing. I mean, certainly you can look at Meredith Monk. Um, she does a lot of her own kinds of extended techniques, and she does a lot of work with patterning. Um, when I was growing up and going to college, I heard the work uh, that Kathy Berberian did with her husband for a while, uh, Luciano Berrio. Uh, she also worked with John Cage. And she came up with some techniques, but they were mostly sort of human sounds. Um, laughing, giggling, gasping, you know, some inhaled sounds. Um, and later on in her life, she sort of eschewed the whole term extended vocal techniques. And uh, I, I did a piece called Cathing, um, which uses a radio interview that she did uh, during a concert of my music uh, in Holland in, in Amsterdam a number of years ago. And um, it's, it's an interesting, you can find it online, but I, I took her radio interview, which basically says that um, it would be a foolish composer who would compose for any of these people who do extended techniques because it's basically uh, it, an impasse. It's it's a stop. And so nobody else could do these things. And she said, they're freaks. Uh, and But she said, you know, they, they used to call me, you know, an extended vocalist, but you see, I can also sing. <laughs> anyway, you have to get it. Uh, I, I took apart her, um, her interview and I treated her voice electronically and then I did extended vocal techniques around uh, her her sound. And actually WQXR, I think, recently uh, played that piece and, and did some uh, discussions of, about that work. All right. Um, and then the last question is from Mary Golden. Um, uh, Barbara, I know you've been classically trained. What sparked your interest in these non-Western techniques? Okay. Uh, Joan is my first name. La Barbara is my second name. Uh, I, I just, I was very curious. Um, I, you know, I, I had Western classical training. I was training as an opera singer. Uh, I never had a big voice, uh, so I probably would have been, you know, a Mozart soprano, maybe Debussy. But um, as I was training, I was beginning to find that I was, uh, uh, I felt restricted. I, I felt that I was... Uh, learning to make sounds as they had been done for hundreds of years. But I wanted to explore the vocal instrument. And uh, I sort of literally ran away from classical music and started working with um, improvising musicians, jazz musicians, uh, new music people, and just imitating the sounds of instruments. That's the way I started. I started with a friend of mine who was a trombone player. Um, and I asked him to just play long tones, and I tried to imagine that sound coming out of me. And so I would then make a sound, and I would make adjustments, and it was a, it was a whole process. And uh, gradually um, began to understand the flexibility of, of the vocal instrument, and then working with other people, other improvisers, I, I sort of threw away um, worrying about what pitches I was producing. And for instance, I was working with a trumpet player, Enrico Rava, um, and he would make this screechy, warbly sound, and I would just, you know, make something like it, not worrying about what, what the pitch was. Um, and so just um, learning from the voice, learning from the instrument, trying things out, uh, a lot of imitation, uh, of instruments, and then finding um, how I could deal with it 
um, intellectually, emotionally, uh, creatively, artistically, and begin to develop these pieces. Well, thank you so much, Joan, for joining us, sharing your wonderful vocal techniques, your insight, your uh, extensive knowledge, and just your presence. It's been lovely uh, to have you. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who uh, tuned in to listen. I'm so excited that uh, we had this uh, available to us. And um, if anyone is interested, HB Studio is looking forward to, uh, in the near future, having a wonderful workshop with Joan on these exact techniques she's been talking about. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll be uh, letting you know about that fairly soon, uh, as soon as we can. So thank you again, Joan. Um, thank you, Lauren. Th and thank you for your wonderful expertise running sound for all of this. It, this is not an easy thing to do, <laughs> to, to go with, with the microphone and dealing with headphones and, and playing music, which then Lauren has to mix at her end. So um, it's, it's complicated. But it's, you know, we're in this brave new world all, all together, and, and we're trying to stay creative and uh, keep, keep at it. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, and thank you, everyone, and have a lovely Saturday evening. Thank you. Bye, everyone.